good hanging, folks. I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. Well, it's no shock that the fast food industry pays some of the lowest wages in the country. What is surprising, however, is the wage theft of these employees that goes far beyond just a low paycheck. One of the worst offenders is perhaps the most famous of them all, Mickey D's. In fact, according to 24-7 Wall Street, McDonald's is the second worst paying corporation in the country next to Walmart. Yes, the Golden Arches have not only managed to pave their way into every crevice of planet Earth, but according to a new class action lawsuit, the corporation not only makes its workers pay for their uniforms out of pocket, but also requires them to regularly clean them. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but when you are making the bare minimum wages, buying and being forced to clean your uniform professionally really is an extra expense that these people cannot afford. In New York, this McDonald's requirement also violates a state regulation that forces companies to reimburse employees for uniform maintenance. In California, McDonald's workers are saying that their hours are never static and are constantly being changed so that they can't ever take home a regular amount. Other workers are alleging that they are not paid overtime, all of which directly violates federal wage laws in the state. Now, because of the way franchises work to absolve responsibility, it's been very difficult to hold giant fast food corporations accountable for horrendous labor abuses. But this time, workers are poised with enough evidence to come out on top for once. So please consider all of this the next time you're dying for an egg McMuffin at the Arch Monolith and support the fight to raise the minimum, minimum wage into a living one. Now let's break the set. It was a terrible mistake, and we're working very hard to make up for it. And once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat-out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No, wait. Do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do, because you've never seen anything like this on television. There are tons of reporters and politicians that have left the mainstream establishment for various reasons, some to be more independent, unbiased, and unpressured from their industries. Then there are some people who march to the beat of their own drummers and not only leave, but go completely off the grid. And that's exactly what former Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura has done. See, for now, he's over living in the U.S. and has opted for happier, more tranquil days to escape the NSA and surveillance drones soon to be flying over our heads. Where is he? We don't know, <laughs> but we were still able to snag him for an interview earlier today. I first asked him to tell us about his new show on Aura TV called Off the Grid and what topics he's covering that can't be covered in American media. Well, uh, the, off the grid is the fact that I feel I'm being censored in the United States. I did a book tour last time and I couldn't get on Fox News, I couldn't get on MSNBC, I couldn't get on any of the networks whatsoever. And so this idea came up to uh, put me on the internet. Uh, I did an interview with Larry King, and Larry, as you know, has left CNN and is part of Aura.TV, and he said, this is where you need to be, and I explained to them that the problem was I had made a life choice about seven, eight years ago to live off the grid four months out of the year, and they said, we have the technology, that's not a problem, we can do it anywhere. And so then it thus became the show where I now talk from the outside looking in as opposed to the inside looking out where I was before. And maybe I'll have a better effect on waking people up and the fact that it's on the Internet, so it's no holds barred. I can talk about anything I want, and the subjects are mine and mine alone. Uh, you've talked about how you left the U.S. also so you can get away from the drones circling overhead. How serious of a concern <laughs> do you think domestic drones really pose for the future of this country? Well, you know, I made light of it, and it was tongue-in-cheek, because, you know, mainstream media is just begging to be made fun of. <laughs> you know, they, they truly are. They're just begging, make fun of us, make fun of us, because they deserve it. So I say things, and they run with it, not like, you know, that we're down here dodging the drones and that. But when you look at it for, on a serious note, it's exceptionally serious. I mean, when our Constitution and our Bill of Rights get violated by the government, why aren't people going to jail for that, or at least losing their jobs? You know, people talk about Snowden, and they say, well, he broke a contract and he revealed this. 
The point is, the Constitution and Bill of Rights are the highest law of the land. They take precedence over anything else. And so that's under assault right now. Our government is operating like they've suspended the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, which is ridiculous. You can't do that unless you declare martial law. But it seems we have an undeclared martial law, and that's what the essence of everything is, is to take back our country and get back the freedoms that we've lost since 9-11. Jesse, you've, you've grown up, uh, you know, through the Cold War, uh, Vietnam, um, you've been in the military, you have a family that's been in the military. You know, you talk about how the U.S. almost is like an undeclared martial law. In what ways do you think it resembles East Berlin, which is what you compared it to in another interview? Yeah, because, I mean, I cross the border every year, and it's ridiculous. If I cross at Mexico, there's nobody there. I've actually stopped my vehicle, rolled the windows down, and say, doesn't somebody at least hand you a piece of paper and say, buenos dias? <laughs> no. They welcome me because guess what? I bring pesos. They know I'm going to spend money down here. They like having me down here. I create jobs. You know I'm a job creator now? I'm creating these jobs down here, and now these illegals won't have to cross the border to pick strawberries <laughs> and take your job. Wait a minute. So, you, uh, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> <laughs> are you being facetious here? Do you really think that Mexicans are coming and stealing American jobs? Would Americans really be wanting to pick strawberries, Jesse? Yes, because all my guys, the people that work for me, have told me unequivocally. They said, Governor, if you weren't, if I wasn't employed with you on off the grid, I would be over the border right now illegally. So there you go. I'm on the job solving illegal immigration and being a job creator. Of course I'm having fun with that, but it's true, it's just on a small level. Well, well do, you, do you support amnesty for actually the, the millions of undocumented immigrants currently living I, and working in the U.S.? I, I support something more than that. Uh, call me crazy, I support taking down borders. I support that we're all human beings on this planet, and why should I have to produce paperwork when I want to go somewhere? How's that one? I, I like that a lot, Jesse. I think that we're both internationalists, <laughs> and I think borders are extremely destructive. And the language of, you know, I'm American, you're this, you're that, gives you some sort of moral authority to do harm and destruction. It couldn't be more damaging, Jesse. I couldn't agree with you more. Let's move on to another well, issue that you're oh, continue. Well, what, what's worse, if you see a big fence with barbed wire on the top and you see someone on the other side of that fence, immediately you suspect them of being something bad, something negative, because you have this man-made fence between you. I wanted to bring up another interesting idea that you've promoted, abolishing the income tax, transitioning to a national sales tax. Really fascinating. Uh, can you really briefly explain how that would work and would reduce the massive inequality levels? Well, what it would do, it would make you the, first and foremost, it would make you the citizen number one again. You'd get your money first. Now, through the current income tax, you get your money second. The government gets it first, so they're number one. You'd get the gross on your check. You know, that fictitious number, what is that number? Well, you'd get that number because you would decide what you paid taxes on by what you purchase. Now, you can still have a safety net. You can declare that, you know, for poverty people, they get their, hypothetically, their first $10,000 purchases free of charge. But anything beyond that, they pay. And you pay at the point of purchase. So therefore, as citizens, you would never face the internal revenue again. You could reverse the internal revenue's role and have them watchdogging business to government to ensure our taxes are properly being used. Never again would I have to keep books for seven years fearing an audit. And if you decided this week you didn't want to pay taxes, you wouldn't have to. Don't buy anything. See, my belief is core belief is this. Wealth is not determined by what you make. It's determined by what you, earn, by what you spend. Because if you make a million dollars a year, but you live in a studio apartment and drive a beat-up Volkswagen, you're hardly living like a millionaire. Now, when you buy the Mercedes and the yacht, well, then you're living like a millionaire and you'll be taxed as such. And it would also mean the government would have to base everything of their operation on our national economy. 
because if the economy would falter, we wouldn't buy anything and the government wouldn't get paid off. Jesse, it seems like a genius concept. I wonder why it hasn't gained more traction because it's totally true. And then people who are in poverty, they would just not have to take half of their earnings given to the federal government to perpetuate the war machine. I mean, they can just go out and spend what they want to uh, contribute to society. Well, um, it just sounds well, so, so smart. And, well, and the thing is, you don't have to tax food. That's an essence of life. Clothing, anything under $150, no tax. You start buying mink stoles, yeah, there's a tax on that if you buy food, if you buy clothing that's more than 150 bucks. But I mean, anybody can buy jeans, you can buy underwear, you can buy your socks, and you won't get taxed. And it would, it would all be based on our gross national product. And it would only need to be about 12%. You're telling me our government can't run off 12% of the gross national product? If they can't, then it's time to replace them. Well, it sounds way too reasonable for anyone in this government to be supporting, Jesse. That's why <laughs> you and I are talking about that, it, I guess. That's, Abby, that's why I'm off the grid. <laughs> <laughs> you have the right, you made the right moves, Jesse. I wanted to really quickly, I know that you've, you've talked about this kind of Cold War resurrection, and I just can't let you go oh. without addressing it. I know that you dedicated a, one of the off the grids to discussing this. I mean. I just feel, I mean, I can't imagine how you feel actually living through the Cold War and then seeing us go back. Um, it, how do you think the situation is going to play out and how can we stop this fear mongering and war mongering in terms of Russia versus the U.S. The, right now? The, fr the frustration is nobody is paying attention to history. It's that simple. And that old cliche, if you don't read your history, you're doomed to repeat it. Trust me. It's happening in decades now, not just in lifetimes. People start reading your history. People start studying what has gone on in the last 50 years, and you see it repeated over and over and over again. What's that other cliche about being crazy? Where if you, oh, yeah, I Einstein. Einstein, if you, if you repeat the same thing and expect different results, I mean, that's the definition of insanity. Yeah. There you go. You're insane. And, and yet we've got this insanity going on. We're doing the same thing, and I'm seeing it now within decades. And I'm only 62. You know, I still consider mentally I'm about 24. You know, it's just chronologically I'm 62. But I'm sitting here looking in my lifetime, having lived through the Cold War, and saying we're going to let, let these morons erect the Cold War again when it was all fictitious to begin with. They were telling their people this story and behind the Iron Curtain. We were telling our people this story on this side of the Iron Curtain. And both sides were getting lied to. Yeah. I mean, you know that it's desperate when the war machine reverts back to that Cold War propaganda. I hope people are smart enough to realize what's going on, Jesse. Rise up. Stop it once and for all. Thank you so much for coming on. Coming up, we'll take a look at why CNN's ratings have soared over the last week. Their patients are force-fed. The explosion near the finish line of the Boston Marathon. More than a thousand people have gathered. What is the latest that you're hearing about the number of victims? <laughs>
that being the most trusted name in news means that you have the audience to back up that claim. But unfortunately for the geniuses running CNN, that hasn't exactly been the case. See, despite having access to over 100 million households in the U.S., last year saw the worst ratings for CNN's primetime lineup in 20 years. Perhaps it's because the network consistently features Bush administration cronies and apologists to analyze international events, like Iraq war evidence fabricator Stephen Hadley. Perhaps it's because people just don't want to watch Pillsbury Doughboy impersonator Newt Gingrich debate Van Jones on Obamacare for the 40th time. Or perhaps it's because 16 hours a day of Wolf Blitzer's no-lens glasses and straggly beard can make even the most avid news junkie lose their mind. <laughs> but thankfully, one story has finally turned around CNN's sinking ratings. All right, good night. One week ago, that was the last communication from the crew aboard Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. Every possible terrorist lead or every possible terrorist scenario has to be uh, drilled down and has to be looked at exhaustively. So what I want to know, the systems in this cockpit, could a passenger have gotten into the cockpit? Do they need it to get into it if they wanted to do something, finagle some sort of major mechanical or electrical system? Especially today, on a day when we deal with the supernatural, when we go to church, the supernatural power of God, you deal with all of that. People are saying to me, why aren't you talking about the possibility, and I'm just putting it out there, that something odd happened to this plane, something beyond our understanding. We have a thousand different theories. We need to bound this thing a little bit and get back to what we know and what we don't know and kind of walk ourselves through what the possible outcomes might be. Mm -hmm. Well, you know how cable news works, don't you, Spider? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good true. We got time to fill here. Yes, because filling time should always be the number one priority of any news organization. Listen, the disappearance of Flight 370 is indeed a baffling mystery and a tragedy for those on board and their families. And that's pretty much all that needs to be said about it until there's a real development. But the nonstop speculative coverage about what could have possibly happened to this plane is insane. And look, I know I criticize the corporate media quite a bit, but this incessant coverage has brought the MSM to a new low. But it's no wonder why CNN and other 24-hour news networks are addicted to the story. See, last week saw an almost 100% rise in the network's primetime ratings, revealing to no one's surprise the true motives of profit-driven news. As long as the story keeps attracting eyeballs, CNN will keep shoving it down our throats. Facts be damned. So, while the corporate media's full focus has been on Flight 370, what important stories have been ignored? Besides Benghazi, the IRS scandal, and Justin Bieber's latest antics, of course. Well, last week in Turkey, protests erupted in Istanbul and Ankara after 15-year-old Birkin Elvin died from injuries he suffered last summer when he was hit in the head by a tear gas canister fired, fired by riot police while trying to buy bread for his family's breakfast. Elvin had grown into a symbol of the protest movement and galvanized thousands to take to the streets to combat the oppressive policies of Turkish leader Recep Erdogan and his violent crackdown on peaceful protesters. No surprise that these latest protests were also met with extreme violence on part of the police. Several media outlets reported that water cannons were sprayed at falling down activists, tear gas canisters were shot inside of a bakery full of people, and plastic bullets were shot at point-blank range. Meanwhile, an incredibly inspiring event just wrapped up in Sochi, Russia. Amidst the turmoil happening just 600 miles away in Crimea, 547 disabled athletes competed in everything from sledge hockey to wheelchair curling in the Paralympics. These largely ignored athletes demonstrated the power and resilience of the human body to overcome all physical odds, giving all of us able-bodied humans a little bit of much-needed perspective on the obstacles in our own lives. But perhaps one of the most important stories here in the U.S. that has been largely ignored by the mainstream is Attorney General Eric Holder's plan to cut prison sentences for potentially thousands of prisoners. Now, don't get me wrong here. Holder has done little in his career as Attorney General to actually justify praise. But the decision to reduce sentences for nonviolent drug offenders is the first of many steps this country must take to reform its prison system. In fact, an ACLU report from last year found that more than 3,200 prisoners are serving life without parole sentences for nonviolent non drug crimes. Excuse me. And if this new proposal is enacted, the federal prison population will be, will be reduced by more than 6,500 inmates serving time for drug crimes over the next five years. 
So you would think that at the very least, the Justice Department's decision to scale back draconian sentencing laws would generate a larger discussion in the mainstream about this country's medieval incarceration methods. <sighs> but unfortunately, dissecting the reasons why a country with 5% of the world's population has 25% of its prisoners is just too complicated an issue for the corporate media to tackle. Because covering issues that actually affect you and me doesn't do too much for ad revenue. You know what does? Speculation, conjecture, and soap opera drama about a plane. And here's the real tragedy. The anguishing families looking for answers now have to watch a network desperate for profits turn their loved ones into a supernatural sideshow. Be familiar with the Zeitgeist Movement. It's a grassroots initiative that's widely regarded as one of the most transformative social movements on the planet. While well, over the weekend, the global community of activists attended the sixth annual Zeitgeist Day, or Z Day, with its main event hosted at the University of Toronto. Z Day provides a platform for thousands of people around the world to discuss some of the most important issues facing global society. And while specific discussions change every year, the end goal remains the same shifting public consciousness to embrace and enact paradigm shifting solutions. Earlier today, I was joined by Ben McLeish, a speaker at Z-Day 2014 and contributor to a new book titled The Zeitgeist Movement Defined. I first asked Ben how the movement has evolved since its first Z-Day. It's been a very uh, organic uh, transition as people have started to hear about it more. So we've certainly seen a groundswell in membership, different diverse people from different backgrounds, not just what you would call the traditional activist types. And we've also seen a fair amount of buy-in from uh, what you term famous people, people who have kind of celebrity who are interested in positively affecting the world. And you were giving a talk at this year's event about paradigm shifts, Ben. Can you expand on the notion that we are in the midst of a new emerging social paradigm? Yes, paradigms are very powerful precisely because they are an interlocking set of ideas that seem to support themselves. Um, so uh, they always claim that they refer to science and the real world and the way things really are. Um, uh, you can see quite clearly how ridiculous this is when you go back and see that we used to believe in toothworms for almost 4,000 years uh, with no physical evidence whatsoever, uh, or the divine right of kings back when we thought that uh, kingship needed to be justified that way. All of these things uh, are always claimed to be absolutely natural. Um, the paradigm we find ourselves in now is uh, probably the most dangerous one because uh, it's certainly a, a mode of behavior on the planet that doesn't take into, into account at all the resources that are actually there. We assume that it's completely infinite. And uh, we're still very much on a centralized ownership and control-based model when uh, really decentralized um, and open and available uh, models are really what we're transitioning towards and which are the most stable, the most sustainable, and include, by definition, the most people possible. I've discussed the Zeitgeist Movement before with its founder, Peter Joseph, on this show, but can you describe really briefly for our audience what a resource-based economy is? And you're talking about the transition and the importance of one. How can we can transition from this paradigm into a resource-based economy? Sure. So a resource-based economy, quite simply, is an economy that explicitly uses uh, the best uh, in science and technology for the welfare and concern of humanity and the biosphere. It's a remarkable fact that uh, the modern paradigm, whatever you want to call it, whether you want to use the snarl word capitalism or anything else, simply doesn't take this stuff into account. Um, so it's a deliberate worldwide understanding of our interconnected nature on this planet, the fact that we do have a planet to live on, and it is, for all intents and purposes, a closed system that we have to maximize in and we have to really look after um, the resources. And that includes things like replenishment rates. It includes basic human needs being uh, serviced and looked after and uh, um, ser served in general by the society. And um, the only way to really do that, to, to follow real efficiency rather than the sort of market efficiency of profit maximization that we see at the moment, is ultimately, ultimately in, in the most important sense, going to yield a, a moneyless society once we really get to functional utility of things. So that's the general overview of it. To get there, well, I mean, you can't do it without education. You can't do this to a room full of blank stairs and, uh, and minds that have not been uh, organized to understand uh, what is actually important in life, uh, why we do actually prefer science and technology in, it seems, everything except things like religion and economics. These things seem to be somehow uh, uh, not uh, in, in line with it. Uh, you're talking about open source technology, uh, things like that. You've cited Wikipedia in the past as an example of what humans can accomplish when information is free. But even Wikipedia is governed by mob rule. 
So who would make the decisions in a resource-based economy? It's not so much that we want to make decisions, it's that these decisions become arrived at. There's actually a very decent writer called Clay Shirky who wrote a very a good book called Here Comes Everybody uh, that describes organization without organizations and describes how essentially as a matter of creating a decentralized open source and available system for anybody who wants to participate, you can mass organize information and create byproducts uh, that essentially don't mean that you have to put anything to a vote. It's a sort of a byproduct of the system itself, the integrity and the, the correlation of each uh, individual to the other and the availability of information on a mass scale that actually allows you to arrive at decisions very quickly. We do this now. I mean, nobody sits and tries to work out where the bandwidth of the internet should go tomorrow. Uh, it's something that through load balancing and intelligent uh, feedback systems and almost approaching the sort of neural network idea of uh, artificial intelligence is something that is essentially produced out of the system functioning correctly. I just wanted to get this out of the way. Um, for those who think that the Zeitgeist movement is Marx's ideal, is the utopia of Marxism, can you explain why it's not? Sure. Um, the end goal of the Zeitgeist movement is not to exist anymore. Uh, we want to create a world that no longer requires the basic advocation and, and, and the delivery of understandings of why science and technology form the cornerstone of anything that's good about your life and about the life around you. And this has not been the case with any of the sort of so-called political movements of the past that want to see a sort of an, a thousand year rule or in any kind of permanent installation of their particular ideologies. We don't peddle in ideologies at all. We peddle in rationality and wanting people to finally think for themselves and not immediately knee-jerk and say, well, who do I vote for to get this in? You can't vote for anybody. Um, there's no person that will do this for you. This is the byproduct of you uh, understanding that the idea of voting for a human or a set of humans amid a systems-governed world is itself an, an act of irrationality, is itself corruption. Ben, you collaborated on a book that just came out called The Zeitgeist Movement Defined. It's also available as an e-book. Can you talk about what the book is all about? Sure, I've got a copy of it uh, here. Um, what we did, uh, it was after many years of requests, is that we've spent the best part of about three years really compiling the front to back train of thought from where we are now presently with economics, what actually is important, um, the various understandings of things like systems theory, uh, and again, we talk about paradigms a lot, all the way through to the fundamental building blocks of how one might approach uh, building um, a, a society on the planet that really is in line with the natural world that we see and that would maximize not just the biosphere, not just humanity, but indeed both. Um, and we put that all together in, a, in, a, in an extended set of essays, fully referenced. Many, many hundreds of sources are in there. So if anybody is finding themselves blankly staring at the screen, not really understanding what I'm saying, um, our book is available completely for free on our website or there's an at cost um, uh, available uh, order from things like Amazon and Lulu. Thank you so much, Ben McLeish, speaker, Zeitgeist Movement. Really appreciate you coming on. That's our show, you guys. Good night.